हरि ओ श्रीगुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओ गजानन भूतगनादिसे कवित्तजंभो बलसार वक्षिधम उमासुदम शोघ विनाश कारण नमा विघ्नेश्वर पाद पंकज गजानन महाकाय विघ्नराज विनायक विश्वेश विश्वशक्ष गणेशा नमो नम ज्ञानंदम देव निर्मल स्फटिखाधि आधार सर्विद्या अयग्रीवुपस्मे यद वक्राध्या पारिषत परशथ विघ्न विघ्न सतत विश्वश्रेन सश्रिय गुरब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुदेव महेशर गुरुर्साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुरव नम गुरव सर्वोका सजे भवरोगिनदे सर्विद्या श्रीदक्षिणाथ नम हरि ओं तत्सत्श्री सर्वेश्वरमस्तु सर्वोपनिषद गावो दोखा गोपाल नोदन इतिहास पुराण दोखा गीता मृत नम साइराम वेलकम टू वी टू ऑफ आवर जर्नी इन टू द सीक्रेट्स ऑफ द पुराणास सो लास्ट वीक आई स्टार्टेड द जर्नी बाय गिविंग यू अ बैकग्राउंड ऑन the puranas its major contents the division of those puranas into the mahapuranas 18 of them and the upapuranas 18 of them as well and today we move on to look at two of the major puranas or mahapuranas as they are known we are looking at vishnu purana and narada purana right sometimes the narada purana is also called naradhya purana right again um i just uh, want to remind all of you that the purpose uh, of these uh, sessions is to give you one an awareness of what the puranas is all about and within that awareness to inject some knowledge of the main significant content of these puranas right because that's all we can do given the time and the resources we have right uh because each purana has, has in excess of 20000 verses so it would be practically impossible for us to cover the entire purana one of them i'm talking about you know in a span of 18 to 20 weeks just one but what we are doing is we are just having a birds eye view we're just going in you know touch base on each purana as we go in and out so i'm giving you the 18 puranas over the 9 weeks so today the 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 purpose as i said to you last week is to see for you to see what you can receive in terms of spiritual learning i use the word spiritual in its exact context i don't use the word religious because as far as i am concerned being religious only puts you in the karma kanda bracket if you want to move up the spiritual ladder you have to get out of the karma kanda being religious you know 
the dogma of religiousness, right? Being indoctrinated in the ritualistic aspects of prayers and pujas and all of that. Get out of that. And go into spirituality, which is jnana kanda or intellectual awakening of the intellectual part. So what you can get from the teachings of the prana, everybody may not get the same thing. You know, there are some things that will resonate with you. There are some things that will pick your uh, heart, touch your brain, hit your mind. And that's what you're meant to get, right? And what you are supposed to do with that knowledge is to see how much of personal transformation you can get from that, right? And that is entirely your responsibility. Okay, so today we look at Vishnu Purana, the first half, and then I'll go into Narada Purana. As you know, Narada is one of Vishnu's primost and dearest devotees. And every time he is anywhere he is seen, the only thing he says is Narayana Yanama, Narayana Yanama, Narayana Yanama. So, right? So these Mahapuranas are a great indicator of various lessons that has already been given to us in the great Upanishads, in the various Samhitas of the Vedas, in the Brahmanas of the Vedas, in the Aranyakas of the Vedas, and of course the Upanishad, which is the fourth quarter of each Veda. So it is like a reminder. So can I just say that again? The Puranas are not saying anything new. It is giving you the same message the same knowledge that has already been given to you via the Bajagovindam, Vega Chudamani, Ashtavakra Gita, right? Amrita Bodhini, you know, so many things, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, you know, uh, 15 week Upanishads I've done with you. All of that is coming back to you from a folk tale, fairy story kind of you know lesson so you look at the vishnu purana and you look uh, at the date of composition right we are looking i mean different authors that have come in different times obviously right the the the, the depth and scope of their research will tell you you know what sort of uh, variation they'll give in terms of the timeline of each purana so the earliest that my research shows right looking at almanacs in uh, Kashi, in the first Vedic university uh, and other um, places. Um, I, uh, I will put it between 300 BCE to 900 BCE. 300 to 900 BCE, right? That's the timeline we're looking at. And many, many go back to 300, and the, the, the most recent one that someone has said is 900. So we put that timeline between that. So it could be 300, 400, 500. But lately and truly, I've said to you, timelines, who authored it, all that is important. What is the lesson for me? That is the most important thing. What can I take from this? How can I use it in my life? How can I not repeat mistakes I've done? How can I push myself to higher levels of spirituality? How can move... How can I move from this level of consciousness to the next level of consciousness? That is all you should be concerned with. Not, you know, little uh, mendicative and pendicative issues like who wrote it? When did they write it? Under which tree did they sit to write it? All that is, you know, muda, jahihi, danagama, trishnam, right? All this information, this circular information is no, no use, useless. So, if you look at the Vishnu Purana, it's got six amsas or six parts, right? Six uh, uh, different parts. So they call amsas. And content wise, it has got 126 adhyayas, adhyayas, chapters, right? So each part has got some chapters. Collectively, over the six parts, you have 126 chapters. Each chapter deals with one aspect of knowledge. So if you look at the initial writings, like uh, when, when uh, Maharishi Vedavyasa was looking at it, you know, there was almost 23 to 24,000 verses. But over the years, they have slowly declined and depleted in terms of, you know, sustaining the content. Now you have probably about seven to 9,000 verses, but the main ones have been preserved, right? So that's in terms of the content. <clears throat> now, 
The start of the Vishnu Purana, interestingly, is a conversation between Rishi Maitreya and his guru, Maharishi Parashara, right? With uh, Rishi Maitreya asking his guru, Pranams Guruji, what is the nature of this universe and everything inside of it? And that's how the Vishnu Purana starts, okay? So, uh, in, in, in his response, the great Maharishi Parashara starts by talking about the creation of the world, the maintenance or sustenance of the world, and the destruction of the world. There's a lot of science here, right? right? As far as I can, uh, I will try and connect it to science. But he was talking to Rishi Maitreya about Shristi, creation, Stiti, sustenance and samhara which is destruction so he's talking about the creator brahma he's talking about the sustainer vishnu and he's talking about the destroyer by he later which is lord shiva but because he's asking what is the nature of the universe and everything in it he focused on vishnu who sustains the universe and everything within it so the first part the first amsa, I told you there are six, right? So we're looking at the first part. It talks about Vishnu, uh, Vishnu's greatness and some of the um, avatars that Vishnu had taken. Specifically in this first chapter, right? Uh, it also makes reference to the fourth avatar of uh, Lord Vishnu, which is Narasimha, right? By speaking about the young boy Prahlada. So the story of Prahlada appears in the first chapter of the Vishnu Purana. But the most part of the first chapter refers to the greatness or the universal the universalness of Lord Vishnu. The, the Vishnu Purana describes Lord Vishnu, and indeed Sage Parashara tells Maitri, what is Vishnu all about? He said, This energy called Vishnu. At that time itself, they are referring to Vishnu as an energy, right? So that time itself, they had the knowledge that these forms are just energies which people should use to transpose themselves from one level of being to another level of being. Simple as that. But today we are so stuck with worshipping the form and we forget the formless. If the form can give you so much of joy, so much of uh, confidence, so much of comfort. Can you imagine the formless? So, Parashara is telling Maitre, this formless energy with form is present in all elements, in all matter of the world, in the entire universe, in living beings, as well as in the Atman itself, your inner self, your very essence. He is present in every living being, nature, intellect, ego, mind, senses, ignorance, wisdom, the four Vedas, 18 uh, Upanishads, you know, he says. That's when he says, the Purusha Shuddham, Sahasra Sirisha Purushaha Sahasraksha Sahasrapad. What does that mean? He says the Purusha called Vishnu has a thousand eyes. Sahasra, Sirsha, Purusha, 1000 eyes. He has 1000 feet. Sahasraksha, Sahasra, Pad, Pad, Padam. 1000 feet. Sabhumim, Vishwatho, Vritva means he has completely engulfed the entire universe and is spread. Ashtatit dashangulam, dasha angulam means your ten fingers. He is beyond the count of your ten fingers. In the next line he says, Purusha ye vedagam sarvam yad bhudam yad chabhavyam utham rathat paskeshanaha yadanne nadirohati. The Purusha is all that is past, all that is present and all that will be in the future. Right? Yad bhudam yad chabhavyam. He is beyond death, beyond fear. He rises from the hiding. Means he gives the entire world sustenance in terms of the food that they need. And the third verse. 
ಯಥಾವಾನಸ್ಥಿಮಹಿಮಾಥೋ ಜಾಯಾಗುಷ್ಟೂರುಷ ಪಾದೋ ಯೀಸ್ಯ ವಿಶ್ವಾಭೂತಾನಿ ತ್ರಿಪಾದ ಸ್ಯಾಮೃತಂ ದಿವಿ ದ ಪುರುಷ ಇಸ್ ಮಚ್ ಗ್ರೇಟರ್ ದನ್ ಆಲ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ನೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸೀನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಅ ಡ್ರಾಪ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಓಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ನೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹಿ ರೆಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಸಿ ಇಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಡ್ರಾಪ್ ಆಲ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಡ್ರಾಪ್ ದ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ is beyond destruction safely engulfed in the worlds beyond that which is captured by our very visuals purusha shukta right so when you get some time you go and look at the words of the purusha shukta and read the meaning right so the purusha shukta by the way is one of swami's famous favorite uh, vedic hymns okay so that's the first chapter the second chapter this is even more interesting right i said to you science right you learn geography in school isn't it the geography the modern geography has uh, contributed greatly and vastly to modern knowledge but we think that is the work of right geography let me tell you the second chapter of vishnu purana which i said between 300 and 900 bce the second chapter talks about the theory of earth the seven continents and the seven oceans going back to 3 to 400 bc they already said this in vishnu purana and they talk about the major role of the mountains they talk about bharata varsha the country of bharat with its with its uh, you know flora and fauna and all of that this is usually this part of the uh, second chapter of, of, of the puranas is taken and utilized in uh, what we call the sankalpa process during pujas and puja vidhis right you know meru ho bharata varshe bharata khande dakshina mire you know like that so many things are taken and put in the sankalpa which is as i said to you in many times an undertaking <clears throat> right now they also talk about the continents and they name the seven continents at that time itself they already named the seven continents called jambu plaksha salmala kusha kraunja sakha and pushkara seven right and they said each one of this continent is surrounded by different types of liquid the color was mentioned and even the taste some will taste like salt some will be fresh water some will be the color and the taste will be like you know uh, palashar you know like a fruit uh, juice sugar cane juice some parts you will find the color like clarified butter some find some parts will be white like yogurt and other parts it will flow white like milk it was this was the extent of accuracy back then in 300 and 400 bc where science had not developed at all 300 to 400 bc right now of course they have all these modern tools and modern gadgets they can look beyond the skies where well, you know go within the depths of the ocean and so on and so forth the second chapter goes on to talk about the spheres above the earth the planets the sun and the moon right bhu bhuvaha suvaha mahaha janaha tapaha um satyam seven levels which is very lee present in the mahagayatri mantra right so it also talks about mount mandara 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 as you know an architectural reference to mandirs the hindu temples you know they are called mandirs or koils or whatever right and mandara which is mountain mount mandara is taken as a reference tool for mandirs and the scientific the reason behind its design image aim and destination right maybe after i finish the puranas i'll think about doing some on the temple architectures to explain to you not just the vastu science behind it but what each part in within a temple represents including you know the tall structure called gopuram and the different things that they put on the gopuram you might think it's fancy art right creative design no 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 at every level specifics are put in order to attract the right sort of energy that is why when you are in the temple 
you should be completely silent. You should stand erect like the Gopuram and just absorb the energy. But what do people do when they go to temple? They yap, 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 and yap with each other and everybody they see. The temple has become a social ground. If you go to any temple and you only hear silence, that is the temple you should go to. If you go to any temple and hear noise, avoid such temples. Because it does you no good. Unless you can be so detached and not be present in all that ruffleness and continue to pray. Otherwise, what's the point? Somebody you know will come and see you, talk to you. Somebody you know, you will go and talk. You went there to pray. At the end of the day, did you pray? And prayer means what? Om Arohara. Finish. Think of it like when a bo your, your boss calls you for a meeting to talk about your promotion. How much of preparation you will be. Phone is switched off. You'll tell everybody, don't call me for the next two hours. I'm busy with my boss for a meeting. Ah. Treat each temple visit like that because you are talking to your creator who is bigger boss than your boss at work. Right attitude. I have always said, only when you have the right attitude, you will develop the right aptitude that will take you to the right altitude. Don't forget. Hmm? Second chapter. Third chapter continues to talk about the Manvantaraha. Manvantara is another uh, part that they use in Sankalpa. Manvantara means basically the timeline of each age. You know, age as in Yuga. Yuga as in three or four Yugas that we have, right? Four Yugas, right? Everything is cyclic. Everything is cyclic. The Yuga is cyclic. Life is cyclic. You know, everything is cyclic. Good is cyclic, bad is cyclic, you know, positive is cyclic, negative is cyclic, good, everything is cyclic. And so is the Yuga. And the third chapter of Vishnu Purana talks about the length, which is, you know, they describe each Yuga as a specific length, you know, more than 306.72 three million years long, each Yuga. And it says already six manvantaras has passed. And the current we are in the at the end of six mantras, at, at the end of the six manvantara in the age of Kali, Kali Yuga. This they have said in 300 BC. That means you must know that the science is fantastic. This is why I said Shruti, Smriti. Shruti, Smriti, what they can see and what they can hear that cannot be seen and cannot be heard by normal beings. Right? And in third chapter, it also talks about the right, you know, R-I-T-E. So the rights of passage from birth to death. Womb to tomb. And it also says something about the cremation rights. Cremation rights, not burial, cremation rights. So it talks about the difference between a karma ganda and jnana ganda. So you see how connected it is. Also in the third chapter, it talks about shraddham. Shraddham, of course, you know, is the um, rites, a pitru puja or ancestral worship, which I've spoken on many occasions, right? It's something that uh, cannot be ignored. And certainly the Vishnu Purana, in its third chapter, makes reference to it, including certain uh, references to wedding rituals, which, of course, in the modern age and time has become less and less and less and less to the point of non-existent, right? The other day, somebody asked me if I can do a wedding. I said, yes, I can do it, provided you give me three hours to do what I need to do according to the Vedic rituals. There are 27 parts that I need to do starting from Ganesha Puja right up to, you know, that Arundhati bit. Oh, that's too long, brother. We can't, can you not take out some? I said, then go and find someone else, please. Very straightforward, very direct. Because people want to get everything done, but don't want to go through the process. 
like you want to get a degree without going to university. Is it possible? Yeah, of course, you can buy it somewhere. That's, that, that's not an issue, but do you have the knowledge? You may have the paper to say Bachelor of Science in Metaphysics or whatever you want to call it. So, all this is not created by man. It is a divine instructions that have been put in various parts of the Vedas, the Upanishads, and certainly to remind man, it has come again in the form of the Puranas. Mm. So it talks about Shraddham, Pitru Puja, ancestral worship. It also talks about certain wedding rituals, third chapter. Right? Here, interestingly, right? Again, I go back to the timeline of its creation, 300 BC to, you know, uh, 7, 8, 900 BC, right? It talks, this third chapter of the Vishnu Purana talks about economic division of labor, but it calls it the Varna system. But how politically abused and misinterpreted this has become, and it's now referred to as the caste system. No, no, no. It is pure economic division of labor. And I've said this many times, right? It says Brahmins should do this kind of work. Should do this kind of work. What work? Worship gods, perform pujas on behalf of others, pray for the welfare of the world. Is that what is happening now? Okay. Hold your thoughts there. The Kshatriyas, what they should do is maintain arms, protect the kingdom, protect the earth. The Vaishyas, what they should do, engage in commercial business, farming, agriculture. And the last class, Shudras, should do all kinds of manual labor like trade and service and mechanical stuff. Pure economic division. What a science. But that has been completely misinterpreted and abused politically for various political reasons. Right? I also told you a few times, right? If you look at the Purusha Shuktam, right? It, ta it talks about Vishnu as a whole entity and different parts of his body representing the Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. And the most divine part of the God, which is the God's feet, is defined as the Shudra. Pado Hyo. Right? Brahmanosya Mukhamasi. Bahu Rajanyakrataha. Like that. It says the face represents the Brahmins. Right? But if God appeared before you, do you look at the face or do you touch the feet first? You hold on strong to the feet, right? Wherever you go and meet any guru, indeed, when you go and see Swami, you are, you are yearning for Father Namaskaram. That is the greatness of the feet. So what is that Purusha telling you? It is saying there is no difference. All of them collectively make me. So why are you saying this is greater, then this is greater, then that is greater, and that is greater? All the one. Move away from this thought, yeah. The Varana system is pure division of economic labor. That's all. Right? And further, this third chapter talks about ethical duties. You know, the more you go into it, right, the more you are so fascinated by the amount of science and the amount of knowledge that was existing in that time when, you know, they did not have anything such as what we have today. Talks about ethical duties. And it says... You know, always do good in your thoughts. Always do good in your words. Always do good in your actions. Don't abuse anyone. Right? Satyam vadha dharmam jara comes from here. Right? Be ethical, be moral to everyone at all times. Then you are fine. Okay? So, this Purana talks about the economic work of man and ethical duties of man collectively. If this is the third chapter is also where you get the four ashramas from. You know, the Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanapatashta, and Sanyasa, four stages of life, four ashramas, four schools of life. Again, it talks about the ethical duties of each school. Brahmacharya, what you have to do, Grihastha, what you have to do, Vanapatashta, what you have to do, Sanyasa, what you have to do. It's fantastic. And it also repeats 
some parts that came in the second chapter about Shraddham, right? Now, what is more interesting here is it distinguishes about things done to uh, the person who is diseased, you know, the dead body, right? And the third chapter says, whatever rites and rituals that are done to the body of the dead person does not do anything to the soul because the soul is already out. You cannot do anything to which you cannot see, touch, feel, or appreciate. That is the soul. So whatever you do to the dead body, this is the Purana is saying, right? Is to please those who are still alive. Because they feel pacified. They feel, okay, this has been done. This has been done. You know, oil has been put, give bath has been given. This has been done. That procedure, all that is to pacify the existing living relatives, friends, you know, spouse, children of the dead person. In reality, it does very little for the onward journey of the soul. So you may have heard me speak um, before, you know, where there was a death. I always say, Focus not on the body. Yeah, do what you have to do because if that's your culture, do it, right? But focus on the continuous journey of the soul. Recite the Triambagam Mantra, the Mahamrityanjaya Mantra and just pray for the soul. Because even after a person dies, you know, a lot of people are still attached. Attached to the body, attached to the thought, attached to the memories. So it's very difficult if you don't release the soul the soul will not be able to continue to travel. I always say, release the soul, release. Don't keep it, you know. So the third book also talks about Mohini and the role that Mohini is Vishnu Purana, right? So if we go to the higher science, Vishnu appears as Mohini to test his devotee's devotion to him. Mahamaya, Mohini Devi, right? And always... They, Mohini is used to go and detract the attention of the Asuras so that the Devas can get what they want. But what it shows is, if you're not focused on what you're going to be doing in order to get the right results, you will be distracted by Maya. Simple as that. That is the reason. That is the, that is the teaching. That is the lesson. The fourth book, or the fourth uh, part, talks about royal dynasties, what the kings have done, you know, the Surya Vamsa and the Chandra Vamsa and, 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 and what they have done, you know, from the, you know, from, from references to Ramayana, references to Mahabharata and all of that. It also talks uh, about the greatness of certain people who have come in certain parts of this uh, dynasties, like Shabari. You know, I, when I, I spoke to you about Shabari when I did Ramayana with you. Uh, Mandotri, when I did Ramayana with you, uh, Narmada, when I did uh, Ramayana with you, Kapila, Rama, Nimisha, Janaka, you know, Sita's father, Buddha, Satyavati, right, Mahabharat, Puru, Yadu, Krishna, Devaki, Pandu, all this Mahabharat. So, Bhishma, he talks about all this. The fifth chapter then moves into Krishna, right, talks about Krishna. And the fifth chapter of the Vishnu Purana is the longest, about 38, uh, you know, 38 chapters. And most of the Adhyayas are contained here. You know, the sayings, the verses. So it talks about Krishna's birth, his childhood pranks, his plays, his exploits, you know. Uh, of course, how he dealt with Mathura, you know. As I always say to you, Rama was born as a normal man with no knowledge who he was. Krishna was born with the knowledge that he was God and none other. So you can, you can see the difference in approach, right? Now you are learning that Rama was one of the inca incarnations. You think Rama, uh, you take Rama as a, as a god with power. No. Rama, when he was born, he didn't know he was. He was just a normal person. So don't attach what you know now to what Rama did not know then. <laughs> okay. Right? Some parts of this uh, fifth chapter also comes in Bhagavata Purana. When I do Srimad Bhagavata Purana in a few weeks, uh, we'll cover some of this uh, again, you know. Um, it's called Harivamsa. Now, the sixth uh, part or the sixth Amsa of Vishnu Purana, the last uh, part, 
talks about the soul, liberation of the soul, and prakriti, you know, talks about the nature of the soul, the composition of the soul, the wisdom of the soul. Indeed, you know, when I did Bhagavad Gita with you, I spoke to you about how Krishna describes the soul and it's the connection with prakriti and the concept of liberation and the properties of pain, happiness, ignorance, all of that, right? So this chapter also talks about the importance of meditation, you know, meditation. So if you want to know about uh, meditation, you should go and look at the... Uh, you know, uh, what is this? Narayani Upanishad. It talks about the importance of meditation as a specific path to worshipping Vishnu. That is why if you look at the Navavida Bhakti, the nine paths of devotion, right? The first one is Shravanam. Then the second part is Kirtanam. The third part is Vishnusmaranam. This is what it's talking about, the third part, right? That, uh, it also talks about uh, the five yamas, the five niyamas. It talks about pranayama. It talks about the value of pratyahara, which is detachment, contemplation, right? After pratyahara, dharana comes, then nidhyana comes, right? You talk, if you look at the ashtanga yoga, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, ashtanga yoga, eight stages. So it talks about this, right? It says, Pure liberation is begotten when one is completely soaked in absorption in Vishnu. In fact, one of the meanings of that Vishnu who means one who is lost <laughs> in meditation. Okay. The last word of the Vishnu Purana says this Vishnu Purana is an indestructible body of knowledge. That's what they're saying. Even then they've said this can never be destroyed. So look at how far we have come, how long we have come, and still the knowledge is there. Right? So that is the sum total or the essence of the Vishnu Purana. Right? Now, Narada Purana starts with something called uh, Nardoktam Puranam Tu Naradhyam Prayachate. That means Everything that is said here has come from the mouth of Narada. And Narada is also a Maharishi, no less, you know. He is also referred to as one of the 18 scholars in the Jyotisha Shastra, right? Within the Narada Samhita of the Upanishad, right? Um, initially, they had this particular Narada Purana had about 25,000 verses, but currently there's about 20,000. There's some depletion there as well, right? Um, 30 to 40 percent again focuses on Vishnu. It's not a surprise because it's Narada. Everywhere he goes, he sustains the Nama, Nama Vali, Nara Yana Yanama, Nara Yana Yanama, Nara Yana Yanama. And again, this is referred to in also the uh, Narada Upanishad, the Veda, uh, the Vedam uh, hymn, right? Om iti ek aksharam namo tve akshare narayana yeti manchaksharam om namo narayana yanamaha. You know, it refers to this particular thing. So Narada is, is one who completely um, promotes that exclusively. Uh, this book also talks about, this Purana also talks about tirtas, yatras. And Mahatmyams. Mahatmyams is, is another word that is used to uh, describe your pilgrimage. You know, Tita, Yatra means all the same thing, right? And talks about the importance of the Shapta Tita. Shapta means seven, Tita means water, right? It talks about the seven holy rivers or waters of India, you know, Gangai, Chayamune, Chayva, Godavari, Saraswati, Narmada, Sindhu, Kaveri, Jalasmin, Sannite, Kurum. You know, we say the mantra when we do the Kalasha worship. That's what it means. This is also referred to here. It also refers to other Puranas saying, you know, what, what is covered in other Puranas. So it is like a, like a precursor to other Puranas. It also talks about Buddha here, right? Again, the date of compilation varies, but record-wise, it looks at the 8th or the 9th century. Now look at the difference in timeline between Vishnu Purana and Narada Purana, right? 
and there are basically two 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 versions right one is called the brahmanaradya purana which is one part of it and the other one is called the naradya naradya or narada purana which is what we are looking at today it's like an encyclopedia which talks about as i said you know 30 to 40% just talks about vishnu and his greatness his amsas his uh, avatars and all of that and it also talks about the aspect of devi as a shakti and the aspect of vishnu as shiva right so again it tells you the difference in worshiping a form and getting stuck to the form as opposed to worshiping the formless nit guna brahma and going beyond the form right versus sat guna brahma narada narada has talked about this worshiping the form is limited worshiping the formless has no limit choice is yours o manushya right the first part uh, of the narada purana actually begins with a dialogue between shuta maharishi and shonaka shonaka maharishi about again you know uh, universal salvation birth of shukadev you know what are mantras what are rituals and the results are very important this is the part i want to focus the result of various fasts being observed on particular days in particular months this is the part where narada talks about satyanarayana puja and satyanarayana katha right now i have done a few and most of you who know that where i have done it in your homes i always told you that the satyanarayana katha is always what shonaka maharishi right told suta maharishi on what puja to do in order to get what benefit so the katha comes in five or six parts right the second part talks about different tales uh, depicting lord vishnu significance of pilgrimage pilgrimage centers various temples and 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 and, and uh, you know uh, what what it gives you so it has two parts one is called the purva bhaga which is the introductory chapters the other is called the uttara bhaga which is the concluding type of chapters right <laughs> the purva bhaga talks about uh, each one of the other puranas in just giving them a little intro because narada is meant to know the knowledge of the three worlds right akara ukara makara purva swaha right he knows all the knowledge that is contained within that so he is already giving little drops of the ocean right in in terms of the puranic significance of each purana and in uttara bhaga he talks about you know the flora and the fauna he talks about food he talks about uh, rajasic food sattvic food and of course tamasic food right so met in the science in this even in those days you know today we have dietitians and nutritionists talking about food content our guys have already given it to us in those days right it talks about music it talks about dance it talks about dress it talks about jewelry it talks about weapons and it talks about theories of war right so it's it's uh, it's uh, it's superb really you know and one of the most uh, powerful things it talks about is ekadashi that means it talks about this particular tithi called ekadashi ekadashi means the 11th day you know you have ekadashi dwadashi triyodashi chaturdashi panchami shashti saptami ashtami navami dashami and then you have ekadashi again right so each day has a specific connotation in terms of significance uh, of observing fasts what type of fast you should do within that observation of the fast what you should eat and what you should not be eating and doing that is how significantly perfect instructions have been given nowadays people tell me oh i am fasting so what do you mean you are fasting oh i only have three meals a day so how many you have normally uh, five or six no uh, being a vegetarian throughout is not called fasting my dear friends fasting means you are doing something that you don't do every day in the normal course of your daily lives that means nil by mouth <laughs> nil by mouth yeah, you can have some water Uh, this doesn't apply to people who are not well or you know the elderly generation or people who take medication and all of that you know that is your karma you have to do that 
but people who are young and able to do that, upavasam, right, is very powerful if done in the right way. Right? Just being vegetarian does not give you anything. Let me repeat that. Just being vegetarian does not give you anything. Okay? I told you about the panchakoshas. If you don't control what you eat, you will have problems. Okay? In terms of moving from the first annamaya kosha to the next pranamaya kosha. Now, the different adhyayas in the Narada Purana contains various tales that Narada has spoken to different people in different times in all his travels and journeys on philosophy, on dharma, on religion and all of that. Of course, all of that gives importance to the worship of Vishnu, right? Uh, it also talks about the, uh, as I said earlier, Satyanarayana Puja, where he talks about the story of, uh, you know, Shaunaka Maharishi and Sutta Maharishi, where these two guys are meditating in a forest called Naimisharanya. Aranyaka, that means in the forest of Naimisharanya. And of course, the Narada happened to pass by. Of course, Narada doesn't appear simply by chance. There's a reason why he appears. And of course, it will look so, you know, impromptu impromptu but that's the reason he's come and suddenly you see him and you'll ask him some question and he'll give you the lesson and you'll go off right so this particular conversation between Shuta and Shonaka was triggered by the presence of Narada in the forest of Naimi Sharanya in the forest right so that is where he said uh, Sutta was asking Shonaka how do we solve the problems of man who uh, who are living in poverty, who are living in distress, who've got, you know, uh, lots of problems. And that's the time Narada passes by. And Shaunaka says, well, who better to give you a response than the great Maharishi Narada Muni, right? So Narada comes and then he says, that is the puja that I am going to tell you about. It's called Satya Narayana Puja. It should be done on Yekadashi, full moon, and then he gives all the instructions and this is what you should be doing. And this is a, the story that you should be telling about what happened to those people who had actually worshipped or done this Atenana Puja on Ekadashi. And he says, he also talks about the four Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, right? He also talks about, uh, you know, um, the difference between worshipping male gods and female gods he said it is only in form right so if you see that he pointed to a cow and then he pointed to a small tumbler of milk say so is there a difference between what you see i'm holding in my hand this milk this little tumbler you know there was some little milk in a, in a coconut shell and the cow so there's no difference because this comes from that if you only look at this you know, your concept of where it has come from is dissipated. But if you look at the cow, you know milk at the end. Likewise, he says, when you look at God forms, move behind the form and look at the significance of what it's teaching you. So that was given by Narada to Shaunaka and Sutta Maharishi. And this is where he always says, it doesn't matter whether you're following Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism, Tantrism, Ganapadism, you know, Kaumaram. End result is, how much travel have you done from where you were to where you are to where you're going to be? So he talks about this kind of philosophy in, um, in uh, Narada Purana. It's uh, very powerful, you know. Um, he also talks about places like uh, Ganga. And he talks about Ganga Tirtham, you know, how powerful Ganga Tirtham is in Narada Purana. He talks about Kashi, Kashi as in Varanasi, or what used, uh, used to be known as Banaras. Now it's back to Varanasi. Um, it talks about how just being in these holy places and just soaking in that atmosphere, right, without engaging in all the hustle and bustle of all the commercial activities. This is where we go wrong, you know. We go to all these holy places. And then we got so carried away with the local markets, with the local trade, people, food, you know, that we forget we are in such a solid place of vibrations. We can just sit somewhere 
in the quietness and stillness of your own mind. Shut down the entire noise around you and just absorb the magnetic field of energy. How much more richer you will be, right? So this is uh, Narada Purana, right? Now let me tell you a story from Vishnu Purana, then I'll end by telling you a story from Narada Purana, right? So Vishnu Purana, right? The story is called Dha, 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 three Dhas, okay? So we are all children of Prajapati, the creator, right? The living beings can be categorized into three groups. All living beings, right? Into three groups. The first group is called the Devas. The second group is called the Manushyas. And the third group is called the Asuras, right? All three were brought before Prajapati and he was instructing them in life and you know dharma and ethics and all of that right now the first group devas are citizens of the celestials denizens of the paradise where they enjoy all sorts of pleasures without the coils of birth and rebirth and death okay the second group manushyas are the human beings who live on earth and the third group the asuras as a result of how they have lived their human life <laughs> Right, become demons and go to the Pathala Loka. Pathala Loka, right? That means the seventh level of the hell. There are seven levels above and seven levels below. Gayatri Mantra talks about the seven levels above, and the Sri Rudram talks about the seven levels below, right? Like that. So after the studies, right, at the end of the studies, that is the course, and they finish the course. You know, these three groups of people approach Prajapati one at a time, right? One group at a time. So first the Devas were called and said, okay, you're, I have finished giving you instructions. Is there um, uh, anything that you want to know? Prajapati asks the Devas. The Devas say, please teach us, Father, you know, uh, how to live in this you know, world without being attached. And Prajapati says to them, Dha! Do you understand what I've just told you? And instantly they said, yes, we understand. You say Dha, as in Dhamyatha. Dhamyatha means control yourselves. Have you understood? Yes. So that lesson for you and me living in this world, live without getting attached. How? Dha, dham, dhamyata, control yourselves. Then he sent them. Then he called the second group, the Manushyas. Again, everything finished. Okay, is there anything you want to ask? They also asked the same thing, right? He said to them, Dha. Do you understand what I've just told you? And the Manushya says, yes, father, we understood. You say, Dha as in Dattha. Ratha means be charitable, right? Okay, that is the way to live in this world. Be charitable. Dana, dhanya, hmm? give. Dana and dhanya, like Karna used to do in Mahabharata, right? Then they left and the third category of people came. They were called the Asuras. The Asuras came and they also said, Father, teach us how not to continue making the same mistakes over and over and over again and being bound by karmic consequences. He said, Dha. Do you understand? The Asura said, Yes. When you said, Dha, you mean Dayatvam, be merciful. When you show mercy and compassion, you are eradicating your karmic consequences. What fantastic! You know, signposts has been given through these three das, just these three das in this wonderful story. Control yourselves, Damyatha, the first da. Second, be charitable, Datha. And the third, be merciful, Dayatvam. 
you know, you sing a lot of bhajans, isn't it? Daya karo shiva ganga dhari. Daya karo kripa karo raksha karo. Daya means compassion, be merciful. This story, I don't know whether I told you when I did Brihadaranyaka Upanishad with you, the story is mentioned there. I may have, but anyway. Right? Now, from the Narada Purana, I told you one of the main focus of Narada Purana is the significance of the various days of the tidhis and the fastings, right? So, for example, some things you can do on Paurami Tidhi and some things you can do on Amavasya. So, full moon, certain powers exist, certain energies exist. You can draw from that. Amavasya, no moon, also certain energies, certain powers exist. You can also draw, right? So, uh, Narada specifically speaks about Ekadashi and the Satyanarayana Puja and Vratha and Kada, right? So he refers to a king in this story called Rukmangada. Rukmangada was a pious king uh, who was married to Satyavadi or Sandhyavali, and they had a son called Dharmangada. Rukmangada had a son called Dharmangada or Dharmangad, as he was known. And he was a very, very staunch Vish Vishnu devotee. Who was Rukmangada was, and he was very, very specific in particular in observing the Ekadashi force. Ekadashi Tidhi. He did Satyanarayana Puja on that day, 11th day of every lunar fortnight. That is Ekadashi, sacred to Vishnu as a day of fasting, prayer, and abstinence. Simple, right? So one day Vishnu said, This guy has been doing this for a very long time, Rukmangada. I am going to test to see whether he is committed to the worship. Right? So who does he call when he wants to test? He calls Mahamaya Mohini Devi. He said, go. Just like Mohini uh, or Menaka, rather, came and, uh, you know, took Vishwamitra out of his, um, you know, dhyana. In the same way, Mohini came and completely as an enchantress, enchanted and took away Rukmangada's uh, focus, right? And uh, he was so attracted to her that he said, will you stay with me? He says, I will stay with you on one condition, right? That whenever I come to you, you cannot question me. You must be with me in that time. So Rukmangada says, okay, right? And so, of course, uh, Mohini started to live uh, with uh, Rukmangada and all of that. But suddenly on one month, on the day of Yekadashi, as he is going, you know, taking his bath and getting prepared to do his, what he does every Yekadashi for years and years and years, which he's been doing. On that morning, Rukman, uh, Ruk, uh, what do you call, uh, Mohini comes and says, now, yeah, after he's just had his bath and he's putting the kumkum and the chandanam, you know, to the various parts of the body before he starts his uh, puja vidhi, Mohini comes and says, I want to be with you now. Today you have to spend the day with me. Of course, Rukmanda says, no, I will not do that. Today is a day where I only do Satyanarayana puja because it's Yekadashi. Get out of my sight, get lost. At which point she reminds him of his promise to her and says, you are a king. You can never break your promise. Now, what reparation is possible? What penalty can I give you, O king, to reflect the magnitude of my feelings that you have hurt, to reflect the magnitude of my loss? What is it that is so near and dear to you, O king Rukmangada? Alas, alas, your son Dharmangada is most closest. If you want me to live, I will give you this ultimatum, right? Then I will release you from this decision and I will leave forever and I will free you. And uh, Rukmangara says, what is it that you want? And she says, if you kill your son, Angara, Dharmangara, then I will release you from your promise and I will leave forever and ever. Now he is in a dilemma. Rukmangada is in a dilemma. He doesn't know what to do. Number one, he wants to do the Satyanarayana Puja because it's Ekadashi and time is passing. 
Number two, this Mohini is saying, unless you do this, you know, I'll hold you to your promise. So he goes and calls for his wife, Sandhyavali. She comes. He says to her, this is the problem. And she says, whatever you decide, you know, the dharmic principle rests in your hands as the king. And he says, okay, go and bring Dharmangada. Brought him. He told one of the swordsmen to come and, uh, you know, behead the son. At which point Mohini says, no, no, no. You have to take the sword and you have to behead him, not your worker. Right? So with a heavy heart, Rukmanda takes the sword from one of the guards and he raises his sword. And just as he's about to bring it down, right, Mohini vanishes and Vishnu appears. Of course, Mohini, as you know, is an apsara. And then Vishnu blesses him and says, you have passed your test. You know, there's no more birth for you and so on. So about you, your wife and Dharmangara all have uh, a direct access to Vaikuntha. Right. That's why Vaikuntha Ekadashi is very, very specific and very, very important. Most uh, Hindus will, will observe that Ekadashi Vrata is separate, but Vaikuntha Ekadashi comes in, you know, December, January kind of time. So the importance of this Katha or this Rukmangara Katha from Narada Purana, it talks about the importance of observing Vratas or fasts. So that brings us to an end to Narada Purana. So I've spoken to you about Vishnu Purana and Narada Purana. And hopefully there are things that I've said throughout that has resonated with your own personal self, with the levels of your own thoughts, you know, the levels of your own speech and the levels of your own action. So you can think, reflect and do something about it in order to progress spiritually and not stay, you know, redundant religiously. Anyada Sharanam Nasti Tomeva Sharanam Mamaha Tasmat Karunya Bhavena Raksha Raksha Maheshwaraha Riyom Tatsat.